So last time we did talk about the Arrhenius definition of acids and bases, um, and those, the definition of an acid and a base under the Arrhenius definition was limited to whether it adds a hydrogen to the solution or if it adds OH minus to the solution. Those were acids and bases, the complete definition. Uh, the difference between the Arrhenius definition and the Bronsted-Lowry definition is actually just in the bases, in that bases are now proton acceptors, not things that donate OH minus or add OH minus to the solution. Uh, and then acids still add a proton, but an H plus is a proton. Right, so hydrogen without a electron is just a proton. So there's a better, wider definition. Uh, so HCl is a Bronsted-Lowry acid because in solution, it donates a proton to water. So hydrochloric acid plus water, uh, that hydrogen leaves the hydrochloric acid, and this is something we mentioned last time as well, these hydronium ions, which is just water with an extra proton, is actually how that hydrogen exists in the solution. That H plus is super reactive, so it's never gonna exist by itself, but H3O plus and H plus will be written interchangeably in chemical equations. So this definition more clearly accounts for what happens. That H plus is transferred, and then here, our water is actually the Bronsted-Lowry base. So it's accepting that proton. So you could label this as the base and the HCl as the acid. The Bronsted-Lowry definition works well with bases like NH3 um, because ammonia doesn't contain any OH ions. Uh, it does still produce OH ions, OH minus uh, ions in solution because it's taking a proton from water. So we have the NH3 here, ammonia, plus our water. Uh, that tr one of those hydrogens is transferred to the ammonia to make ammonium, which is NH4 plus. And then we get OH minus, which is the hydroxide. So it does, in this case, create OH minus just indirectly. So here, our base is the ammonia and our water is the acid. So acids and bases will always occur together because if there's something donating a proton, it has to be donated to something. This is kind of like redox, if that analogy helps you at all, where electrons were being transferred from one thing to another. So if you had something that's being reduced, if it's losing or if it's gaining electrons, those electrons have to come from somewhere. So in the cases of acids and bases, one of the reactants will be the acid and the other re reactant will be the base. Uh, and water is a special type of acid and base, which is called amphoteric. So water can either accept a proton as a base or it can donate a proton as an acid. When the equation representing the Bronsted-Lowry acid-base behavior of ammonia is reversed, so we've taken that equation from earlier, written it backwards, now NH4 plus is the proton donor, so it's an acid, and the OH minus or hydroxide is the base. So this pair of uh, acid and base, all right, so in this direction, this forward direction, the acid is NH4 plus. If we reverse it, then it uh, becomes a base. So these are conjugate acid-base pairs. So in one direction, it's the acid. The other direction, it's the base. And again, the whole definition is just uh, if it's donating a proton or if it's uh, receiving a proton, accepting a proton, right? Because NH4 plus 
when we go from our reactants to our products, has lost one hydrogen. And that's what makes it an acid. So any two substances, again, this idea of the conjugate acid-base pair, any two substances related to each other by the transfer of a proton can be considered a conjugate acid-base pair. Um, this is different, so for water, we have water, uh, let's say plus HCl. The H, the proton on HCl, the hydrochloric acid, is gonna be donated to the water. So we'll get H3O plus, plus Cl minus. So here, water is acting like a base and its conjugate acid is H3O plus. So we can take this reaction and write it the opposite direction. And now that hydronium the H3O plus, is losing one of those protons to become water. So this is now the acid and its conjugate base is the H2O. So when written out in a reaction, the conjugate acid or conjugate base is always going to be the product. But we could write these together and say that H2O uh, slash H3O plus is a conjugate acid base pair. So our base accepts a proton, becomes the conjugate acid. That's why it's always the product. Uh, or an acid donates a proton and becomes a conjugate base. So actually, we could have written this on this example here as well, that HCl is, our, is an acid. So Cl minus, or chloride, is the conjugate base of hydrochloric acid. And then that reverses when we reverse the uh, reaction. So chloride is a base because it's the proton acceptor going from reactants to products. And that's also the conjugate acid. HCl is the conjugate acid for that reversed reaction. So it doesn't have to be water. Um, anything that's donating a proton or accepting a proton is either going to be a base or an acid, and then it's going to have a conjugate acid or conjugate base on the product side of the reaction. All right, this is where we can use the word cloud. Oh, I need to switch this to present. And I need to fix the properties. I'm just gonna go up there, does it matter? Um, why does it do this? No, that's not what I wanted. All right, there it goes. So actually, I'll write this on the board. 
minty.com and the code is 45009943. Obviously, I can't leave this up on there because it's uh, blocking the slide. So, in each of these reactions, we have to identify the Bronsted Lowry acid and the Bronsted Lowry base. So those are going to be our reactants, and then their conjugate acid and conjugate base, which will be products. I can write this on the slide too, actually. Uh, 450 zero, zero, 9943. Okay. So the C5H5N, is that going to be the acid or the base? So we essentially just, I don't want to do this. All right, so this is, <laughs> yeah, I right, got two in there. It's funny when you have a word cloud with one word because it's just <laughs> one really big word. So yeah. This is going to be a base. So then is water the conjugate acid or the, or sorry, is water, the, is water an acid or a base? Yeah. Acid. Um, okay. So then C5. H5 and H plus would be conjugate acid or conjugate base. Mm, maybe this isn't going to work to use it like this. Yeah, that's going to be our conjugate acid. And then OH minus will be the only thing that we have left, our conjugate base. All right, so all we have to do to figure out if it's an acid or base is find which one's donating the proton and which one's accepting the proton. So for this next one, is there a way that I can clear this quickly? Um, yeah. All right, so HNO3 is going to be, is it going to be our acid or our base? Yeah, it's going to be our acid. And then H2O is going to be an acid or base. Forget about the Mentimeter thing for now. <laughs> it's too slow. It's going to be our base. Well, and that's why we try things, even if they don't work. <laughs> okay, so if we've identified our acid and our base, it's fairly easy to identify what's going to be the conjugate acid and the conjugate base, because it's just the one that matches on the other side, right? So nitric acid became nitrate. So if it's the acid and the reactants, then on the products, it has to be the conjugate base. And then for H3O+, plus, uh, has to be the conjugate acid. And does it like have the same name? So we know that HNO3, nitric acid, for one, if you know how to name it, it's acid is in the name, but it goes from HNO3 over to NO3 minus. So it went from having a proton to not having that proton. So Right, so acids are proton donors, so they give up a proton, and bases are proton acceptors. So then water, here is H2O, and then on the product side, it's gained one more hydrogen, which is that proton. So it accepted a proton, so that's the base. 
you have to kind of like read it like a before and after, where your reactants are your before and the products are the after. So going from left to right, what happens? Yeah, it's also kind of like a spot the difference, um, looking at the left and the right. Okay, so acid-base reactions, we talked about neutralization reactions, acid-base reactions, generally form water and a salt, or an ionic compound. So if we have hydrochloric acid reacting with potassium hydroxide, the proton here from the chloride reacts with the OH- minus from the potassium hydroxide uh, and forms water and then whatever's left over forms the ionic compound. So we took the potassium here and the chloride to form that salt. And then we're gonna go back and remember net ionic equations and complete ionic equations. Uh, we would know that the net ionic equation for many neutralization reactions is going to be just H plus reacting with OH minus to form H2O. Because as an ionic compound, and in our net ionic equation, or, or a complete ionic equation, this would be K plus plus Cl minus. So there's still ions in the solution uh, and would match their ions uh, from the reactants. And actually, this, this is the lab that we're going to do next week. We're going to use one of these neutralization reactions to determine the concentration of an unknown, I think it's an unknown base. So we're going to add acid to it, and it'll change colors, and that's when you know you've reached the end point. So what's happening is, as we add the acid to our base, it's turning all of that base into water, so that there's none of it left. So it's kind of like uh, you're adding stuff in until it's all used up. Uh, but we'll talk about that more later. Uh, reaction of acids with carbonates, so sodium bicarbonate, which you have on the, uh, your lab benches. We used it at least one time to neutralize one of the acids that we made. Um, and that produced a bunch of bubbles. Those bubbles were CO2. So that was this reaction of the sodium bicarbonate to produce water, CO2, and also a salt. So this was also a gas evolution reaction. Okay, writing out equations for neutralization reactions um, is fairly easy, as long as you follow the rules, which may or may not be easy. Um, so, write a molecular equation for the reaction that occurs between phosphoric acid and aqueous sodium hydroxide. So, in these problems where you're asked to write out a reaction, that means they have to give you at least the two starting species in the word problem itself, right? So, this is saying that this is a reaction that occurs between H3PO4 and sodium hydroxide, right? Phos Phosphoric acid, sodium hydroxide. So our reactants are going to be H3PO4 plus sodium hydroxide. And we're given this hint here also that H3PO4 for phosphoric acid is a triprotic acid. Uh, and did we mention this? So these hydrogens in front, these are the I think we mentioned that these are the ionizable hydrogens. So these are the hydrogens that can react. And for this class, we're just gonna assume that all of them react. So our products are going to be, because this is an, a neutralization reaction, one of them is gonna be H2O. The other one is going to be our salt. And our salt is going to be made up of the things that aren't H2O. So in this case, um, and actually let me write this too. So write the neutralization net ionic equation 
is H plus plus OH minus forms water. So we can identify the H plus from our reactants here as the hydrogens from phosphoric acid. And then the OH minus coming from our sodium hydroxide. So that means that our uh, salt is going to be made up of phosphate and sodium. So this is where knowing how to write the formulas for uh, ionic compo compounds comes into play. Phosphate, I'll write it up here actually, is PO4, three minus. And sodium is Na plus. So we're gonna need three sodiums to balance the charge on phosphate. And then we need to balance this equation. Uh, so we can start with start with sodium. So if we have three sodiums on the right side, we only have one sodium on the left in our reactants. So we'll put a three here. Um, this is one of the ways that uh, balancing chemical equations can be a little bit tricky, but it helps to know that something like phosphate is going to be kept as a unit of phosphate. So these oxygens don't really affect these oxygens. So we can look here and see that there's three sodium hydroxides. That means we have three oxygens. So that's not going to change this number of oxygens because these are all going to be coming from here. So we just need to add a three in front of the water because now these oxygens will be balanced with these ones. And that means that we have six hydrogens now. But if we look on a reactant side, three times the hydrogens here, that's three of them. There's another three from phosphate. So the hydrogens were balanced because we balanced everything else. So it's writing equations for neutralization reactions, or at least predicting the product. There's at least, there's one problem on the practice final currently where I just tell you what the products and the reactants are in the word stem, the question stem, um, but I gave you all of them. So then all you need to know is, oh, these, ones, these two are the things reacting, they're producing these two things. So you write them out as the reactants and then the products, and then you just have to balance it. Any questions about writing neutralization reactions? Nope, okay. Uh, the other type of acid reaction, another type of acid reactions are acids reacting with metals. Um, we did talk about the activity series super briefly. I don't really expect you to remember it. Um, but in these acid reactions with metals, you have some acid reacting with a metal to form hydrogen gas and then a salt of the acid and the metal. This is actually, which is zinc on here? Yeah, zinc is actually the reaction that we used when we were producing the hydrogen gas. So this is the reaction that you were doing, uh, except we use HCl instead of sulfuric acid and we produced hydrogen gas. Uh, so acids react with metals uh, that causes the metals to dissolve into the solution. So that's why, that's the salt that it forms. It's a soluble salt. And then it produces hydrogen gas uh, and leaves that dissolved salt behind. So that's why too, when we did this reaction, the metal was completely gone afterwards because what was left of that metal, that metal didn't turn into a gas, it just dissolved into the solution so you couldn't see it. Acids can also react with metal oxides. Um, so if you had something like potassium oxide, 
here we're getting a reaction more similar to a neutralization where we're making water instead of hydrogen. But again, we're ending with a salt um, that comes from the anion of the acid and the cation of the metal oxide. All right, so write an equation for each reaction. So again, this is where nomenclature is important. Hydrochloric acid reacting with strontium metal. So those are gonna be our two reactants. Hydrochloric acid is HCl. And we know that it's not a oxy acid because it's hydrochloric acid. This prefix tells us that it's just a binary acid. And then reacting with strontium metal is just gonna be strontium. So this is strontium metal, it's a solid. So because we're reacting with just strontium metal and not an oxide, our products here are going to be hydrogen gas plus the salt of the strontium and the anion from our acid. So this will be strontium chloride. And again, nomenclature comes into play because strontium has a two plus charge. This is also a redox reaction, but strontium has a two plus charge when it's an ion. So it's gonna need two chlorides to balance that. Um, and then we just balance this. So if we're looking at the differences between our reactants and our products, there's one hydrogen and one chlorine, but we have two hydrogens and two chlorines. So all we need to do is add a two before the hydrochloric acid. For the reaction of hydroiodic acid with barium oxide, um, so hydroiodic acid, again, hydro means it's a binary acid. So it's just gonna be H I plus our barium oxide. So it'll be BA uh, and barium forms a two plus charge, so we're only gonna need one oxygen because oxygen has a two minus charge. And then our product here for reactions of acids with oxides is going to be water plus the salt of our metal and the anion from the acid. This will be barium iodide. So we need two iodines there and this one will balance the same way out of two before the hydroiodic acid. And that'll give us the two hydrogens and the two iodines. Okay. Rushing through these a little bit. Was there a question? No? If I'm rushing through it, that means I don't think it's as important as the stuff we're going to get to. Know that. Okay, uh, so the most important base reactions are neutralization reactions. We really deal with bases a lot less than we deal with uh, acids. Um, I'm just gonna show this one to you. We're gonna look at it a little bit. Aluminum is one of the few metals that actually dissolves in a base. So if you take sodium hydroxide, you have to react it with aluminum and excess water because you get this sodium aluminum hydroxide and hydrogen gas. Okay, this is the important stuff. This is what you're gonna need next week for the lab. Um, so we talked about solution stoichiometry on, I think it was on Tuesday, might have been last week, Thursday. No, it was Tuesday. So we talked about solution stoichiometry, um, and that's important for, uh, very important for acid-base titrations because it's how we can quantify one acid or base with another acid or base. If you know the concentration of one, you can quantify the other. So the idea behind these titrations is taking a substance in a solution of known concentration 
and reacting it with another substance in a solution of unknown concentration. And at its root, we have this net ionic equation, um, for example, between hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide is again, hydrogen plus hydroxide makes water. So when we're doing this, if we have an unknown solution of sodium hydroxide, there's gonna be some number of hydroxide molecules in the solution. And all we're doing is adding acid until those hydroxides are all used up. Because we know how many uh, protons we're adding based on the concentration of our solution. So we can say that the number that we added is equal to the number that we uh, reacted with. And so the concentrations, or at least the number of moles, will be the same. So an HCl solution is represented by this molecular diagram. Right? We've got hydrogens. It's not a very interesting solution. It's just hydrogens in water. In our following diagrams, only the hydrogens and OH minus ions that precipitate or participate in the net ionic equation are shown for clarity. So we're just going to be looking at the ones participating. So as you can tell, there's no chlorine in this, no chlorine that were, is visible in the solution. So a solution of known concentration of hydroxide is added to the solution of unknown concentration of H plus. So we know what the concentration of this is, and we don't know what the concentration of our flask is. At the equivalence point, the color changes. And so maybe like a really simple, uh, I'm trying to think of like a really, really simple analogy. If you're like, let's think about it like decorating cupcakes. <laughs> You've got a tray of cupcakes. Um, no, maybe that's not a good analogy either. Dang, because you can count the cupcakes. Essentially what we're doing here though is like, if you didn't know how many cupcakes there were, but you knew how much frosting you have, and you know that every cupcake takes a certain amount of frosting, you've got all the frosting in the world, but you're icing these cupcakes and icing these cupcakes until you lose count, but you've got, I don't know, a vat of frosting that's got markings on it. So you know how much frosting you used you say, okay, if I used a tablespoon of frosting per cupcake and I used up 20 tablespoons, then I must have frosted 20 cupcakes. And that's essentially what we're doing here, but we're adding hydroxides to hydrogens. So we don't know how many hydrogens are in here, but we can essentially count the amount of hydroxides that we add. And with a little deductive reasoning, say if we use this many, then there must have been that many in the solution. Um, and then we know when we've reached that equivalence point because we had something called an indicator um, that changes the color of the solution when the hydroxides are used up. So that's what a titration is. We know how much frosting we're adding to the beaker and so then we can count how many cupcakes we frosted inside of that flask. So, like I mentioned, that equivalence point is usually signaled by an indicator or a dye that depends on the concentration or the, the acidity of the solution. Um, usually the concentration of one of the reactant solutions is unknown and the other one is known. So again, we're just carefully measuring the volume of each solution required to reach the equivalence point. And then we can calculate what the unknown solution's concentration is. My wife and I actually, when we got married, uh, did a titration on stage as our like marriage whatever. You know, some people like pour the sand together. We didn't wanna do that. So we had lab goggles and everything and uh, mixed two things together. We wanted to do the same reaction that happens in glow sticks but we got married at 5.30 in June, and so it was like broad daylight, and there's no way you were gonna see it. <laughs> so we mixed two things together that turned blue. Two clear liquids, mix them together, they turn blue. So that's how big of a nerd I am. 
<laughs> okay, so when we add sodium hydroxide to an HCl solution, um, they're mixing in here, and those uh, are adding to the H plus. So we're adding the OH minus, it's reacting with the H plus, turning it into water. And then when we've reached that equivalence point and we've used up all of the H plus, then the indicator changes pink. Phenolphthalein, which is a fun word, is the indicator that uh, it's colorless in an acidic solution. So acidic solution, meaning that there's extra acid. Um, and then once that solution turns basic, um, it changes pink. So titration of a 20 mil sample of H2SO4 solution, this is gonna be our unknown concentration, requires 22.87 milliliters of 0 0.158 molar potassium hydroxide solution to reach the equivalence point. What is the concentration in moles per liter of the unknown H2SO4 solution? All right, so key thing here to remember, molarity, uh, also molar is moles per liter, and moles is a count of how many atoms or molecules there are. So we can take the known concentration and volume. This is how many hydroxide atoms we had to add, or hydroxide molecules that we had to add to the solution. Um, and that means that there were that many H plus atoms in the solution to react with. So mathematically speaking, um, we take our 22.87 milliliters. So that's how much hydroxide we used. And then because molarity is in moles per liter, we have to convert this into liters. So there's a thousand milliliters per one liter. I'm sorry, I should write this out. I like the stoichiometry it is. All right, so this is just a stoichiometry problem. I should delete this. Okay. All right, so converting this into milli or into liters, and then we can use 0 0.158 molar KOH. I'm sorry, this is moles per liter. And for now, actually, we're going to just stop there. Okay, so this will calculate for us how much, how many hydroxide molecules we added to the solution. So 22.87 times 0.158 divided by 1,000. So we added 0 0.003613 moles of potassium hydroxide. Um, we do, I think we do actually need a, a reaction equation here. So if we have, again, this is H2SO4. reacting with our potassium hydroxide. So this is an acid-based titration, which means it is a neutralization reaction. So one of our react, one of our products is going to be water. Whoops, that's not water. And then the other product is going to be the base uh, the salt formed from the cation from our base and the anion from our acid. This would be K 
K2SO4. Um, and we're going to need two hydroxides, and we're going to form, or two potassium hydroxides, and we're going to form two waters. So wanted to illustrate something with this, and that's that potassium hydroxide has one hydroxide. Sulfuric acid, H2SO4, has two hydrogens. So that means that immediately tells us that there's a two to one ratio between them. So we're gonna need two hydroxides for every sulfuric acid that's reacted. So you don't necessarily need to write this thing out, but it can help illustrate that point. Um, and it can help, it's a, it's a surefire way to know that you're getting the right ratio. So that means that if we added this many moles of potassium hydroxide, then we can take this and say 0 0.003613 mole KOH and then our ratio between potassium hydroxide and sulfuric acid is one mole sulfuric acid for two moles KOH. So we take our moles of potassium hydroxide that we use and divide it by two. So in other words, 0 0.00180 six, seven moles of H2SO4. We're not quite done yet because we want to know the concentration of our solution of sulfuric acid, which is why they gave us a 20 mil sample. So if we take our uh, number of moles of sulfuric acid and divide it by the volume in liters, that will give us the concentration. So this uh, zero, 0 0.001867 divided by 0 0.0200. means that our concentration of sulfuric acid was 0 0.09, uh, three sig figs, 0 0.03 molar What was that? And that same number? Yep. Is this considered a girl <laughs>, <laughs>, laughs nervously. Uh, no, it's a, well, I, I think it, for this, this would be like a B-level question. Because it's a solution stoichiometry problem. It's just a solution stoichiometry. You got a, you got to take all these things and boil them down. Um, yeah, it's a solution story so geometry. Yeah. Yeah, I just converted the milliliters to liters. Um, yeah, the key concept with this is that we're adding, where was that slide? I like this slide. Right, we added all of this potassium hydroxide, so this was potassium hydroxide, and there was H2SO4 in the flask. So the amount of potassium hydroxide that we add to get it to this point, which tells us that, hey, sulfuric acid's all used up, um, that the OH equals the H 
plus. And that's why we needed the ratio between H2SO4 and potassium hydroxide, which is just one OH. Because there's two of these for every one of these. Um, okay, so acid-base titrations, that is what we're gonna be doing next week. We'll have some more of those. Um, in this class, we really focus on strong acids. So I remember we had, well, this in the solutions and solubility lab, you watched Andy play with solutions of strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. So things that dissolve completely into ions and things that don't dissolve completely into ions, as well as uh, molecular compounds like sugar. So the strong electrolytes should have lit up the light bulb strongly. The weak electrolytes should have been a dim light. And then the molecular compounds, it didn't light up at all. So the difference between a strong acid and a weak acid is the di same difference between a strong electrolyte and a weak electrolyte. So strong acids dissociate completely or ionize completely in the solution. So all of our HCl is going to H plus and Cl minus. Uh, for hydrofluoric acid, that's a weak acid. So really, most of it is staying as hydrofluoric acid, HF. And a small amount, maybe I'll just write these really small, is becoming those ions. The majority of it is still this. So our strong acids ionize completely. This is like when we talked about ionic concentrations um, in chapter 13. The ionic concentration of a strong acid is going to be all of the uh, products. So strong acids are strong electrolytes. So one molar HCl will give you one molar H3O plus. So that's that H plus ion. We're just kind of slightly introducing here that if you put brackets around something, that means the concentration of, the molar concentration of. So this equals molar Cl minus. And this is another concept that'll come up later, but this single arrow indicates complete ionization. I don't know if you've noticed, on some of these you'll get uh, this half arrow so it's going in one direction and the other direction, which is sort of hinting at what we'll talk about in 15. Uh, a lot of these reactions, let me take it back, all of these reactions to a certain extent also happen in the reverse direction. So you're making products um, and you're also having those products go back into reactants. So pure water doesn't connect electricity, um, but the presence of ions allows that electricity to be conducted. Again, so strong electrolyte, bright light bulb. Um, we mentioned this with that, well, kind of with that H3PO4, right, phosphoric acid, um, is a polyprotic acid. So monoprotic, right, mono, means one, protic, protic equals proton. So a monoprotic acid has one proton. A diprotic acid, di meaning two, has two protons. Um, could also call it a polyprotic, meaning multiple. And then you could also call phosphoric acid triprotic. So those are, these are the ones that you really have to watch out for in any type of titration because that's when you need to have a ratio between uh, your acid and your base. Weak acids don't completely ionize, as I've mentioned. 
Um, they're also poor conductors of electricity, so you get that dim light bulb. This reaction arrow uh, indicates partial ionization. It also means that you have a significant amount of your products becoming reactants again. So there's this constant flow. Oh, we did talk about dynamic equilibrium with vapor pressure um, or things vaporizing. So if you have water in a contained flask, um, especially if you leave it for a while, it's got clear sides, you can see water condensing on the walls of that container. Um, so that's water going into the vapor and then condensing on the sides and then also condensing back into your actual liquid. Um, so that'll equalize or reach an equilibrium. Um, but again, chapter 15. So pure water, again, does not conduct electricity, but a weak electrolyte will conduct a little bit of electricity. So you get a dim light bulb. Uh, there's a lot of weak acids. Uh, this term gets thrown in here. Carboxylic acids are weak acids. Um, that is an acid that has this form. So you've got carbon with a double bond to an oxygen and a single bond to an oxygen. And this is the proton that could leave as a weak acid. That's an organic chemistry thing. Um, you can have diprotic or uh, triprotic. So the sulfuric acid listed with a strong acid is also listed with strong acids. It's a diprotic acid where the first one is a strong acid, but taking off the second hydrogen is like a weak acid. Don't need to know that too much though. All right, so which of these is a weak acid? So the way you would answer this question is this one has hydroiodic acid. This is H nitric acid. This one is acetic acid, uh, which is, or is it formic acid? It's formic acid. So which one is completely ionized? Or which one's not completely ionized, I should say? It's kind of hard to see it. It's, true. it's harder to see up there. So for this first one, are there any, um, are there any of these that are not ionized? So that are still existing as HI? No, they're all ionized. So that's a strong acid. Okay, so it's not that one. That's not the weak acid. And again, here we're looking for something. These white balls, again, are hydrogen. So looking for a nitrate that still has a hydrogen on it. Doesn't look like there's any, right? So that's a strong, yeah, it's hard to see that. But this one was probably even the hardest to see on the projector. It's not too bad. Uh, I know it doesn't do red very well. So most of these, we're looking for like H3Os. There's one here that is ionized, um, but it looks like all of the rest of these are not ionized. So this would be our weak acid. Weak acids become a lot more if you a lot more important if you take more chemistry the math surrounding them and like how much exactly ionizes, you can calculate it, but we don't get into that. Okay, so we're gonna determine the H3O plus concentration for each of these solutions. Um, the first thing that we wanna do is determine if it's a weak or a strong acid, right? Because if it's a strong acid, then it's however many hydrogens um, are in the acid multiplied by its concentration. That's how many hydrogen or H3O plus hydronium ions would be in solution. And maybe I'll just give this to you. This is weak. So if this is a weak acid, 
That means we're only getting partial ionization. Um, and this will come up on the pH worksheet, which we haven't gotten to yet. So this is going to be, these are two less than signs. It's going to be a lot less than 0 0.50 molar H3O plus because it's a weak acid. So this one is a strong acid. So our concentration of H3O plus is going to be, again, this 1.25 molar times the number of hydrogens. So in this case, there's just one hydrogen, so it's the same. So 1.25 molar H3O plus. Hydrofluoric acid is another weak acid. There's really, really the only way to know if it's a strong or a weak acid is to look it up on the table or to have it memorized. So if I put a question like that on the final, it will be with a table of strong and weak acids. Okay, so what would the concentration of H3O plus B in a solution of hydrofluoric acid. There's kind of two options here. It's either the same, right, this times the number of hydrogens, or it's a lot less than. So is it the same or is it less than? Less than, because it's a weak acid. So there will be some concentration of H3O plus it's just going to be a lot smaller than the concentration of the acid. Oh, we're making amazing progress. Actually, let me do one more here. So if we have a strong acid, um, let's use this one. Phosphoric acid. We're just going to say that all of the ions are strongly ionizable. So what would the concentration of H3O plus be for this solution? If this is a strong acid. It's equal to this times the number of protons. So here we have three protons, three ionizable hydrogens. So this would be 1.80 molar. So 0 0.60 molar times three, because we have three hydrogens. Yes. If it's a strong acid. Okay. If it's a weak acid, then it's just going to be a lot less than the concentration of the acid. Yeah, hydrogen is a proton. Proton is hydrogen. Well, it doesn't quite work the other way. All right. So strong bases and weak bases, same thing as strong acids, weak acids. Uh, they're just bases. They're just basic. Uh, unlike diprotic acids, uh, which ionize in two steps, bases containing two hydroxide ions dissociate in one step. So for a strong acid like sulfuric acid, and in reality, H phosphoric acid does this as well every hydrogen that you pull off actually gets harder to remove. So if you remove one hydrogen, it's harder to remove the second hydrogen, and it's even harder to remove the third one. So these, in reality, after the first one's removed, will act like weak acids to remove the second or third one. Bases are not like that, though. These, when they um, go into solution, will completely dissociate at the same time. 
So it'll lose both of those hydroxides simultaneously. So something like strontium hydroxide is going to give us two hydroxide ions in solution. All right, so visual, this dissociates, and this would be the sodium, and then our hydroxides from those sodiums. Weak bases are analogous to weak acids. So again, we're going to have a smaller concentration of um, hydroxide than the base that we added. So here we're using B. This is not boron. This is uh, generic for a weak base. But our weak bases often form hydroxide indirectly. So we looked at this one before, but ammonia uh, removes a hydrogen from water to create that hydroxide and the hydro or, uh, ammonium ion. So again, if you were to look at like a model of these, we have our ammonias and then we have one ammonium in the solution that's got an extra proton on it and then the one hydroxide that it made. So there's a lot of weak bases, a lot of them involving nitrogen in some form because that nitrogen will take one hydrogen from the water which is the case for all of these. If we look at the difference between the reactants and the products, we can see that, again, ammonia became ammonium. Um, I don't remember exactly what this one's called, but here we have, right, this compound gains one more hydrogen. Here we have a methyl amine, which is what that one's called, but it gains another hydrogen. And then ethyl amine just has another carbon but here NH2 grabs one more hydrogen to become NH3. And in all of these, they're taking that from water to form the base. Bicarbonate does a similar thing in water uh, where it forms H2CO3 by taking a hydrogen from water. Um, if we want to determine the OH minus concentration of a solution, this is a similar thing. Identify whether it's a strong or a weak base. So barium hydroxide is going to be a strong base. So what would the concentration of hydroxide be? Multiply the concentration, kind of like we do with the strong acids. Multiply the concentration of our base by the number of hydroxides. So here we take the 0 0.55, 0 0.055 times 2 will give us 0 0.110 molar hydroxide. This one is a weak base. So again, analogous to acids, what would the concentration be? It would be less than 1.05. That's as detailed as we're going to get. This one is a strong base. Uh, can actually, bases, strong bases versus weak bases are easier to identify because uh, the strong bases are all a metal plus hydroxide. So this will be sodium, magnesium, potassium, calcium, all of those things, plus uh, hydroxide is going to be a strong base. So what's the concentration of OH minus here? Yep, it's the same, 0 0.45 molar. Because we have one hydroxide, so we multiply by our 0 0.45 by 1, and it's the same. Excellent. Uh, so, and I know it's 626, but 
I think we can finish this out. Again, we're going to be going long today. But it's going to be do a lot for getting us on track if we can finish this. So water is amphoteric. It can act as either an acid or a base. Talked about this up top. Um, even in pure water, water acts as an acid and a base with itself, a process called self-ionization. So there's always some water reacting with some other water, and they're exchanging hydrogens one way or the other. So one becomes H3O plus, the other one becomes OH minus. And then they'll swap those back, and they'll swap with other ones. Um, and this is just a constant process that's happening in water. Again, this is a dynamic equilibrium. So the self-ionization reaction occurs only to a very, very small extent. Like, very, very small extent. It's happening, just not very much. So for pure water at 25 degrees C, the amount of H3O plus is equal to the amount of OH minus. Because for every OH3 plus that's created in pure water, that hydrogen had to come from another water. So if one hydrogen is donated to, one hydrogen is donated, let me go back to this. Right, so if this guy donates his hydrogen, oh, weird. So this one is the acid. So it gives one hydrogen here. That means that we've created both one H3O plus and an OH minus. So those concentrations have to always be the same in pure water. Right, so that's what this is saying. H3O plus concentration, molar concentration, is equal to the molar concentration of OH minus. And those are both equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 7 molar. So the ion product constant for water, and we'll get more into these Ks uh, in the next chapter, is 1 times 10 to the negative 14 where we're taking the concentration of H3O plus and multiplying by the concentration of OH minus. Um, and little exponent math trick, if you multiply two exponents together, you're, you add the exponents. So this 1 times 10 to the negative 7 uh, multiplied by 1 times 10 to the negative 7. We take the negative 7 plus the negative 7 it means our answer is going to be 1 times 10 to the negative 14. So that's what this is telling us. So for a neutral solution, the concentration of H3O plus is equal to the concentration of OH minus. Because to make one in pure water, you have to make the other. If we have more H3O plus, then the concentration of H3O plus is going to be greater than 1 times 10 to the negative 7. And the concentration of OH minus will then become less than 1 times 10 to the negative 7. For a basic solution, the opposite's true. So acidic solution is more H3O plus. For a basic solution, we have more OH minus. But for any solution, if we take this concentration and we multiply it, sorry, if we take the concentration of H3O plus and multiply it by the concentration of OH minus, we'll get 1 times 10 to the negative 14 again. So those two things multiplied together will always be 1 times 10 to the negative 14. Because as one get big, gets bigger, the other one gets smaller. So this is a, a scale that's telling us the interdependence of H3O plus and OH minus. You can see, so this top one is H3O plus, the one on the bottom is OH minus. And so we're kind of taking a line, drawing a vertical line here, and then we can move this, actually let me move it here. We can move this slider back and forth, and that'll give us the concentration. So let's say we have a solution, 
uh, and its concentration is one times ten to the minus fifteen or minus five. Right, so we're here. That one times ten to the minus five means that our basic, or our, sorry, one times ten to the minus five. H3O plus means that our concentration of OH minus has to be uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 9. Right? That's our OH minus. And if we take this and we multiply it by this, we're going to get 1 times 10 to the minus 14 again. And so you could take this and we could move this to somewhere else and we could do that again and it's still going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 14. So as one goes up, the other one goes down. Um, those 1 times 10 to the minus 5, 1 times 10 to the minus 9, um, it's a little harder to work with. Uh, I guess we'll get to pH in a second. Uh, so if we wanted to calculate one of these things from the other, we use this, the fact that 1 times 10 to the minus 14 equals concentration of H3O plus times the concentration of OH minus. So that's an equation that we can use to convert between the two. So here we just take 1 times 10 to the minus 14 equals, uh, we have an OH minus concentration, excuse me, and then we take we want to find H3O plus. So we multiply H3O plus by 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2, because that's our OH minus concentration. Uh, wait, I sh should use it like that. I should write it like this. So now we can just divide both sides by 1 time 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2. So 1. And this is where that E button on your calculator really comes in handy. 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2. That means our H3O plus equals 6.67 times 10 to the minus 13. So that solution acidic or basic. If there's, and this is where working with exponent, negative exponents can be a little bit confusing, right? A larger negative exponent is a smaller number. So let's do this though. Let's go back to this uh, and I'll erase these. So we have one times 10, uh, you can use either of them, right? Let's use the hydroxide concentration, 1.5 times 10 to the minus two. So I can take this slider and looking at our hydroxide here, we're gonna move it to one times 10 to the negative two. So over here. And it's, you know, not quite one times 10 to the negative two, but it puts us in the neighborhood. Uh, so that means that we have a basic solution because this, to the negative two is a larger number than to the negative 12. Don't worry, there's a better way of writing these numbers. So this is gonna be basic. For this next one, we'll do basically the, <laughs> basically the same thing. One times 10 to the minus 14 equals H3O plus times 1.0 times 10 to the negative seven. And that's molar OH minus. So if we divide both sides by one times 10 to the negative seven, our H3O plus is going to be 1.0 times 10 to the negative seven. So that would be a neutral solution because the concentration of hydroxide is the same as the concentration of uh, hydronium. So this is a neutral. And actually, let's just come back here real quick. Use the same illustration. 
So if we move this slider so that OH minus is times 10 to the negative 7, and H3O plus is times 10 to the negative 7, then we have a neutral solution in between acidic and basic. Can you guys even see the stuff on the ends? Nice. Cool. All right, so maybe we won't use that. Uh, so if we have this, 1 times 10, again, this is the same problem, 1 times 10 to the negative 14 equals our H3O plus times 8.2 times 10 to the negative 10 molar OH minus. All right, so 1 E uh, to the negative 14. Also, when you type on your calculator, um, you do 1 E to the negative 14. There's a different button for negative than there is for minus. Uh, on my calculator, it's this one down here. If you use a minus, it's going to tell you syntax error. So just make sure you're doing that. Okay, divided by 1.8, or 8.2 e to the negative 10. So it didn't give it to me in scientific notation. But I'll put it into scientific notation. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5. So is that solution acidic or basic? Yeah because the concentration of the acid is bigger than the base. Okay, so I've been saying times 10 to the negative a lot. Uh, we have an easier scale that also removes that negative, makes it easier to tell if one's bigger than the other, and that's the pH scale. So this breaks it down if pH is equal, that's, or sorry, if, if you have a neutral solution, pH is seven. If pH is less than seven, it's acidic. If pH is greater than seven, it's basic. Um, and that seven is related to one times 10 to the negative seven. And it's related through a log function So a decrease of one unit on the pH scale is actually decreasing by times 10 to the 1. So it's 10 times larger or 10 times smaller. So if we look at this going from pH 4, which is the same as 1 times 10 to the negative 4 molar, we'll call that, we'll make one dot here for that. If we go from 4 down to 3, that's now times 10 to the negative 3, we've increased our concentration 10 times. And if we go down to, neg or we go to 2, which is times 10 to the negative 2, we multiply that again by 10. So going from 4 to 2 is not just 20 times, it's 100 times. So this is called a logarithmic scale. Um, so small changes in pH result in huge changes in um, the actual concentration. <laughs> I like that this just says explain logarithms. Um, I'm gonna explain this and then we'll actually come back to this because I wanna talk about it again next week because it is that important. So, let me just show you what happens first if we take the log of something. So pH equals the negative log. So if we take the negative log of 1 times 10 to the negative 7. Okay? This log function part basically just says what exponent would we have to raise this number to? Or what, yeah, what exponent would we have to raise this number to to get, would we have to raise 10 to to get this number? So for 1 times 10 to the negative 7, 10, sorry, negative 7, that's going to be negative 7. So 1 times 10 to the negative 7, if we take 10 and raise it to the negative 7, we get our original number. And then we multiply that by a negative so that we get positive numbers. 
So this will be positive 7. So if we want to go the other way to get back to what our original number was, we take 10 and we raise 10 to whatever our pH is, uh, to our negative pH. So 10 raised to the negative 7 gets us back to our original number. Um, this gets a little bit more complicated when the number in front is not 1. And that's when you end up with like 7.5. So let's just take the negative log of 5 times 10 to the negative 3. So on my calculator, if I do negative, um, and here there's a difference between LOG and LN. For pH, you always have to use LOG. So the result of this, 5e to the negative 3, gives me 2.301. So if I want to get back to, if I want to go back to 5 times 10 to the negative 3, I say 10 raised to negative 2.301. So 10 raised to negative 2.301. And that gives me 0 0.005, which is the same as 5 times 10 to the negative 3. I know logarithms are super confusing, but the actual implementation of them I don't think is too difficult. If you could remember to go, well, if you remember just this, it's written on the top left there too. pH equals negative log of the concentration. And then 10 raised to the negative pH equals your original concentration. We'll also talk about on Tuesday pOH. So pH is the concentration of H plus. pOH is the concentration of OH minus. And the function, though, is exactly the same. Concentration, the negative log of the concentration gives you the pH or pOH. 10 raised to the negative pOH or pH gives you the concentration. I would recommend just playing with this on your calculator a bit. And then I think is the um, is the pH worksheet posted? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I would look through that. It's in the chapter fourteen um, module. It has some of these problems working back and forth between pH and pOH, or again, the homework problems should have it in there too. So we haven't finished chapter 14, we'll finish it next week, so the homework won't be due this week. But we're really just gonna talk about pH and pOH. All right.